Free will is defined with all the freedom that any Arminian could desire. It might seem that here is a proper place to ask the question, does man have a free will? Is it true that his choices are not determined by motives, by inducements, or by his settled character? Can a person resist God's grace and power to make an uncaused decision? However, these questions will not be answered here. They will be discussed later. The next step in the argument is a slightly different one. Let us assume that man's will is free. Let us assume that these questions have been answered in the affirmative. It would still remain to be shown that free will solves the problem of evil. This, then, is the immediate inquiry. Is a theory of free will, even if true, a satisfactory explanation of evil in a world created by God? Reasons, compelling reasons, will now be given for a negative answer. Even if men were able to choose good as evil, even if a sinner could choose Christ as easily as he could reject him, it would be totally irrelevant to the fundamental problem. Suppose there were a lifeguard stationed on a dangerous beach. In the breakers, a boy is being sucked out to sea by a strong undertow. He cannot swim. He will drown without powerful aid. It will have to be powerful, for as drowning sinners do, he will struggle against his rescuer. But the lifeguard simply sits on his high chair and watches him drown. Perhaps he may shout out a few words of advice and tell him to exercise his free will. After all, it was of his own free will that the boy went into the surf. The guard did not push him in nor interfere with him in any way. The guard merely permitted him to go in and permitted him to drown. Would an Arminian now conclude that the lifeguard thus escapes culpability? This illustration, with its finite limitations, is damaging enough as it is. It shows that permission of evil, as contrasted with positive causality, does not relieve a lifeguard from responsibility. Similarly, if God merely permits men to be engulfed in sin of their own free wills, the original objections of Voltaire and Professor Patterson are not thereby met. This is what the Arminian fails to notice, and yet the illustration does not full justice to the actual situation. For unlike the boy who exists in relative independence of the lifeguard, in actuality God made the boy and the ocean too. Now if the guard, who is not a creator at all, is responsible for permitting the boy to drown, even if the boy is supposed to have entered the surf of his own free will, does not God, who made them, appear in a worse light? Surely an omnipotent God could have either made the boy a better swimmer, or made the ocean less rough, or at least have saved him from drowning. Not only are free will and permission irrelevant to the problem of evil, but further the idea of permission has no intelligible meaning. It is quite within the range of possibility for a lifeguard to permit a man to drown. This permission, however, depends on the fact that the ocean's undertow is beyond the guard's control. If the guard had some giant suction device which he operated so as to engulf the boy, one would call it murder, not permission. The idea of permission is possible only where there is an independent force, either of the boy's force or the ocean's force. But this is not the situation in the case of God and the universe. Nothing in the universe can be independent of the omnipotent Creator, for in Him we live and move and have our being. Therefore the idea of permission makes no sense when applied to God. Such subterfuges must in all honesty be renounced. Consider two quotations from Calvin. Quote, Here they recur to the distinction between will and permission, and insist that God permits the destruction of the impious, but does not will it. But what reason shall we assign for his permitting it, but because it is his will? It is not probable, however, that man procured his own destruction by the mere permission without any appointment of God, as though God had not determined what he would choose to be the condition of the principle of his creatures. I shall not hesitate, therefore, to confess plainly with Augustine that the will of God is the necessity of things, and that what he has willed will necessarily come to pass. God is very frequently said to blind and harden the reprobate, and to turn, incline, and influence their hearts, as I have elsewhere more fully stated. But it affords no explication of the nature of this influence to resort to prescience or permission. For the execution of his judgments, he, by means of Satan, the minister of his wrath, directs their counsels to what he pleases, and excites their wills and strengthens their efforts.
Thus, when Moses relates that Sihon, the king, would not grant free passage to the people because God had hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, he immediately subjoins the end of God's design, that he might deliver him unto thy hand. Since God willed his destruction, the obduration of his heart, therefore, was the divine preparation for his ruin. End of quote. Thus the futility of free will is established. Some other theory must be sought, and in the production of that theory it will become evident that free will is not only futile but false. Certainly, if the Bible is the word of God, free will is false, for the Bible consistently denies free will. The arguments so far adduced are more than sufficient for the solution of the main problem. Further consideration could make the exposition more complete and might remove from inexperienced minds a number of distortions and objections that frequently present themselves. Calvinism undoubtedly stimulates many misapprehensions, although the reason for their frequency, as has already been seen in the discussion on puppets, is not a point in which Arminians can take pride. At the same time, Calvinists acknowledge that they themselves have a responsibility to forestall such misapprehensions so far as possible. The Westminster Confession and other Reformed creeds urge caution, not so much in opposing free will, for the Reformers were outspoken in their championship of grace in opposition to free will, but in preaching the doctrine of election and the divine decree. This does not condone those professors in Bible departments who, supposing that they know better than God what should be revealed, demand that the doctrine of the divine decree should be suppressed in silence. But it does require that the scriptural passages be clearly exegeted, that the doctrine should be logically integrated with the rest of God's revelation, and that at least the main objections should be squarely answered. A recent volume, Divine Election, by G. C. Burkauer, is largely motivated by the pastoral concern to protect the congregation from the uncertainties and fear of a harsh presentation of election, predestination, and the related themes. Professor Burkauer is a theologian of great erudition. His volume, The Triumph of Grace in the Theology of Karl Barth, is a triumph of scholarship. Similarly, The Conflict with Rome is a masterpiece. The book under discussion also evidences a wealth of knowledge. Its doctrine is unmistakably Calvinistic, and yet some of its hesitations and fears seem to be unfounded. Most of the dangers that he mentions have no doubt actually occurred, as in the writings of a certain Snethelage, whom he mentions. These dangers could possibly be more common in Holland than in the United States, but so far as the present writer's experience goes, it would seem that the greater and far more common dangers are those of the opposite tendency. For one thing, Burkhauer thinks that it is necessary to deny that Calvinism is deterministic. The word determinism apparently carries some evil connotation in his mind. Unfortunately, Burkhauer never clearly defines determinism. Between the lines, we may gather that determinism for him automatically makes all differences within God's predetermination relative and unimportant so that preaching becomes useless. There are, of course, various types of determinism, atheistic and mechanical, as well as theistic and teleological. This, however, is a poor reason for avoiding the word determinism. On the contrary, a uniform avoidance of this term might suggest to the congregation that the pastor does not really believe that God controls every event, and this unfortunate result would surely be more serious than any mistake arising from the word determinism. Sinful human nature is much more apt to deny or to circumscribe God's authority in favor of human independence than it is to exaggerate the power of God. Pastoral caution and care, therefore, lead rather in the opposite direction. Burkauer also cautions against ascribing absolute power to God, against asserting God's superiority to all law, and against calling his decisions arbitrary. In each case, however, there is a sense in which these terms can be used of God as well as a sense in which they are objectionable. Perhaps Occam's idea of absolute power is not correct, yet Burkauer admits there is no law superior to God, and that in this sense God is indeed ex lex. When discussing the parable of the employer who paid his laborers the same wage regardless of the time they worked, Burkauer says that this was not arbitrary, it was good 
So it was, but Birkauer's concern seems centered more on words than on their meaning. Birkauer also shows himself to be suspicious of the concept of causality, largely because the idea of cause tends to, quote, a metaphysical determinism which leaves no room for variation and differences, but which subsumes everything under one causality of God, end of quote. This is an empty objection if there ever was one, and the discussion leaves much to be desired, because Birkauer admits that, quote, it is inherently difficult to give any answer that in itself would be transparent to reflective and reasonable thinking. Birkauer goes on to say, quote, On the one hand, we want to maintain the freedom of God in election, and on the other hand, we want to avoid any conclusion which would make God the cause of sin and unbelief, end of quote. Birkauer, in spite of his Calvinism and his many truly fine statements of the Reformed position, is so embarrassed by his imaginary difficulties that once he even stumbles into what I take to be an historical blunder, he writes, quote, What Jacobs says of Calvin, that in his preaching and commentaries the election of God is repeatedly discussed, while rejection is not mentioned, can be said with as much validity of the Reformed Confessions, end of quote. This sentence, in its context, seems to mean that the Reformed Confessions do not even mention reprobation. This is not true, and we hope that Birkauer intended to say something else but merely failed to express it clearly. That the ostensible meaning, however, is not true is undeniable. Earlier in this chapter, a part of the Westminster Confession was quoted, and the reader's attention is again called to the third, fourth, and seventh sections of chapter three of the Westminster Confession. It is not by a strained analysis of the concept of causality that Birkauer can avoid calling God the cause of sin or can contribute to the prevention of misapprehensions. There are indeed two mistaken conclusions that should be guarded against, not so much for the purpose of protecting Calvinistic congregations from anxiety and insecurity as Birkauer believes, but in order to save Arminians from the blunders they have fallen into. In connection with the clause, God is the cause of sin, something yet needs to be said about causality, and second, something needs to be said about God's holiness. Burkauer had complained that the divine attempt to explain the divine decree in terms of causality prevented the acknowledgement of differences and variations within the divine decree and therefore eliminated these distinctions in the historical process. Even though Burkauer admits that there are two types of causality, he still concludes that, quote, every discussion of causality fails, must fail, end of quote. The question is slightly complex. One part of it has to do with the necessity of means or secondary or proximate causes. God does not do everything. He hardly does anything immediately. For this reason, the Westminster Confession, to which Burkauer pays insufficient attention, has a phrase about secondary causation. It is human nature, depraved human nature, to attempt to avoid responsibility for wrongdoing. In seeking to excuse himself for an evil act, a man may assign the blame to his tempter, as Adam and Eve did, or to compelling and extenuating circumstances, or to something else more remote and ultimate. The insincerity of this procedure becomes apparent when we notice that men do not try to avoid praise and honor by referring their good acts to ultimate causes. They wish to escape blame, but they are willing, only too willing, to accept compliments. The Christian view, however, is clearly expressed in David's great confession. David did not complain, I have sinned a great sin, but alas, I was born sinful and could not help it. So do not blame me too much. On the contrary, David said, I have sinned a great sin, and what makes it all the worse is that I was born that way. I could not help it, for I myself am evil. Repentant David placed the blame not on his mother, nor on Adam, nor on God, even though all these are causes in the chain of causation leading to his sin, repentant David placed the blame on the immediate cause of his act, himself. The doctrine of creation, with its implication that there is no power independent of God, does not deny but rather establishes the existence of secondary causes. To suppose otherwise is unscriptural, and to avoid the notion of causality is illogical. Burkauer's contention that an original, all-inclusive, 
universal decree of causation removes other distinctions is also untenable. He is afraid that the principle of causality would conflict with the very scriptural position that guilt is the judicial ground of condemnation. Now this is an important factor, a most important factor for pastoral caution. The majority of people, both inside and outside the church, are immersed in practical details, and their vision seldom rises to more general theological principles. They need the point emphasized that God condemns people for their sin. In particular, evangelistic endeavor cannot omit the fact of sin, but Calvinism does not make any such omission, nor is there any inconsistency. The doctrines of election and reprobation do not conflict with the fact that God's punishment is visited on no one who is not a sinner. The sinner deserves his punishment because he is evil and has done evil. No innocent person suffers. To be sure, Calvinism also insists that there are no innocent persons, except Christ, of course. All are dead in sin. Salvation is a free, unmerited gift. Sin alone has merited wages, and those wages are death. All this Calvinism proclaims without compromise. There is nothing in the divine decree that is inconsistent with acknowledging sin as the judicial grounds of punishment. Burkhauer's claim that the concept of cause removes particularities from the divine decree is therefore untenable. There are admittedly other details whose discussion might obviate various misunderstandings. To consider them all, even if they were not repetitious, would require a length and minuteness incompatible with the present plan. There is, however, one extremely important topic that cannot be omitted. Does the view here defended make God the cause and author of sin? Burkauer asks this question also, and so has everyone else. Let it be unequivocally said that this view certainly makes God the cause of sin. God is the sole ultimate cause of everything. There is absolutely nothing independent of Him. He alone is the eternal being. He alone is omnipotent. He alone is sovereign. Not only is Satan his creature, but every detail of history was eternally in his plan before the world began, and he willed that it should come to pass. The men and angels predestined to eternal life and those foreordained to everlasting death are particularly and unchangeably designed, and their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. Election and reprobation are equally ultimate. God determined that Christ should die. He determined as well that Judas should betray him. There was never the remotest possibility that something different could have happened. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth. Psalms 135, 6. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? Daniel 4:35. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Isaiah 45, 7 The Lord has made all things for himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 16, 4 You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Does not the potter have power over the clay? from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Romans 9, 19-21 Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. Romans 11, 22 One is permitted to ask, however, whether the phrase cause of sin is equivalent to the phrase author of sin. Is the later phrase used to deny God's universal causality? Obviously not. For the same people who affirm causality deny the authorship. They must have intended a difference. An illustration is close at hand. God is not the author of this book, as Arminians would be the first to admit, but he is the ultimate cause, as the Bible teaches. Yet I am the author. Authorship, therefore, is one kind of cause, but there are other kinds. The author of a book is its immediate cause. God is its ultimate cause. This distinction between first and secondary causation, explicitly maintained in the Westminster Confession, has not always been appreciated, even by those who are in general agreement. John Gill, for example, who is so excellent on so much, failed to grasp the distinction between the immediate author 
and the ultimate cause. For this reason, there are some faulty passages in his otherwise fine work, such as the difficulty of the problem, and so confused are the discussions from the time of the patristics to the present day, that some of the best Calvinists have not extricated themselves completely from scholastic errors. Not only Burkhauer, but even Jonathan Edwards, in spite of Calvin, still spoke about God's permission of sin. When, accordingly, the discussion comes to God's being the author of sin, one must understand the question to be, is God the immediate cause of sin? Or, more clearly, does God commit sin? This is a question concerning God's holiness. Now, it should be evident that God no more commits sin than he is writing these words. Although the betrayal of Christ was foreordained from eternity as a means of effecting the atonement, it was Judas, not God, who betrayed Christ. The secondary causes in history are not eliminated by divine causality, but rather they are made certain. And the acts of these secondary causes, whether they be righteous acts or sinful acts, are to be immediately referred to the agents, and it is these agents who are responsible. God is neither responsible nor sinful, even though he is the only ultimate cause of everything. He is not sinful because in the first place, whatever God does is just and right. It is just and right simply in virtue of the fact that he does it. Justice or righteousness is not a standard external to God to which God is obligated to submit. Righteousness is what God does. Since God caused Judas to betray Christ, this causal act is righteous and not sinful. By definition, God cannot sin. At this point, it must be particularly pointed out that God's causing a man to sin is not sin. There is no law superior to God which forbids him to decree sinful acts. Sin presupposes a law, for sin is lawlessness. Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. But God is ex lex. True it is that if a man, a created being, should cause or try to cause another man to sin, this attempt would be sinful. The reason is plain. The relation of one man to another is entirely different from the relation of God to any man. God is the creator, man is the creature. And the relation of a man to the law is equally different from the relation of God to the law. What holds in one situation does not hold in the other. God has absolute and unlimited rights over all created things. Of the same lump he can make one vessel for honor, and another for dishonor. The clay has no claims on the potter. Among men, on the contrary, rights are limited. The idea that God is above law can be explained in another particular. The laws that God imposes on men do not apply to the divine nature. They are applicable only to human conditions. For example, God cannot steal not only because whatever he does is right, but also because he owns everything. There is no one to steal from. Thus the law that defines sin envisages human conditions and has no relevance to a sovereign creator. As God cannot sin, so in the next place, God is not responsible for sin, even though he decrees it. Perhaps it would be well, before we conclude, to give a little more scriptural evidence that God indeed decrees and causes sin. 2 Chronicles 18, 20-22 reads, quote, Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, In what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You shall persuade him, and also prevail. Go out and do so. Now therefore look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you." End of quote. This passage definitely says that the Lord caused the prophets to lie. Other similar passages ought easily to come to one's remembrance. But that God is not responsible for the sin he causes is a conclusion closely connected with the preceding argument. Another aspect of the human conditions presupposed by the laws God imposes on man is that they carry with them a penalty that cannot be inflicted on God. Man is responsible because God calls him to account. Man is responsible because the supreme power can punish him for disobedience. God, on the contrary, cannot be responsible for the plain reason there is no power superior to him. No greater being can hold him accountable. No one can punish him. There is no one to whom God is responsible. There are no laws which he could disobey. The sinner, therefore, and not God, is responsible. The sinner alone is the author of sin. Man has no free will.
for salvation is purely of grace, and God is sovereign. Deo soli gloria. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Woe to him who strives with his Maker. Shall the clay say unto him that forms it, What are you making? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, I have made the earth and created man on it. It was I, my hands that stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts I have commanded. O oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out! For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen.